Seen a lot of people get in from car sales to real estate sales into so IT as you're well. You're only as good as your next quarter. So you yeah. can still close a whole heap of business. And I know some salespeople that actually get depressed. What they... does it take you just to survive mm. in the corporate mm. environment? Unfortunate, but most of the tertiary degrees in cyber are, are really. Right. I think that happened more in the low interest rate environments. And you, and you remembered in the in the 2020s and 2021s, you had AWS and Google and the major software companies Don't hiring. Don't get the M high and then just uh, reach whatever you can. So yeah, it's, sure. it's a hot topic at the moment. Many boards actually put as a number one agenda item these days. So oh. it's usually. Australia, it's uh, Russia, it's China, it's North Korea, even Iran to some some extent. Is it the best way to stay alive in this industry, or as well? I think the I think the secret is not burning your. your Joe, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure for me just to have you on my platform. I was actually thinking of how am I going to introduce you? I've done the intro separately, but for our viewers, uh, there's so many words I can describe you. One of them is the gentleman of this business, the gentleman of IT. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on. Yeah, thanks for those comments at the start as well. Uh, I'm not sure if they're warranted, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely <laughs> explore them. In terms of where I started, uh, I it would have been in the in the two thousands. It was the IT the IT boom. I wasn't in IT at the time, and uh, having completed a science degree, I there was a bit of IT subjects in there, coding and 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 the like. But it wasn't until that two thousand boom where I had a few friends working for Cisco, Nortel, and Terasys, and they were really having a good time. A few of them were working for storage companies as well. And uh, yeah, then I, after a few years, I did an, M an MBA with a with a IT major, and then after doing some studies, I found out that you really didn't need to do tertiary studies to be at IT. You just needed to get in there and do some specific vendor training or on, on whatever you were working on. So that's how that's how I really got in. Always been interested in technology, and uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds funny, but we talk customer outcomes. But when you do solve a problem for a customer, be it um, save money or time or reduce risk or, or whatever it is, there, there's that satisfaction that you get now that was the same 20 years ago. Similar sort of thing. So very very worthwhile uh, career so far. So between science, your passion to science mm -hmm. and technology, mm. really you did a shift. Yes. Um, that was a really big shift. Mm. What drove you to do it? Like mm -hmm. when, when did you say, oh, I've had enough with science and chemistry or yeah, yeah, chemical that... industry, and then you jumped into technology. Sure, sure. Yeah, so after the science degree, I did work in a few roles in, in that area, namely uh, Dow, Dow Chemical, and also uh, James Hardy Building Products. It just generally, there was very little manufacturing happening in those days in Australia, and it was a, it was a sunset industry. So it, it, part of it was the lifestyle, but also the, also the money. I mean, um, there were almost double the salaries that you can get in the in the IT sector and because it was emerging it was very simple to uh, to learn about what you were selling uh, I started in sales and yeah just shifted from the chemical industry sales to to IT sales and, and that would I've seen a lot of people get in from car sales to real estate sales into IT as well so the the shift is fairly easy it's a similar s skill set I'm glad you you found it really easy because normally yeah. when you study something, you'll be really attached to it. Mm. But obviously, you haven't been like you didn't have um, did, you didn't have enough passion for the chemical industry. Uh, look, I look at it a, a different way. Having worked at organisations like Salesforce, Pegasus Systems, and and a, and a few others in the SaaS space, it's surprising the people that you speak to there. And there could be the head of solution engineering. I remember speaking to a lady once and she said, I studied anthropology, nothing to do with IT, but yeah. often some of these major organizations require you to have a degree to show that you can work in a, in a group, you can present in front of people, you can take on some subject matter and be able to understand it and apply it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. So it's so yeah. back then, did mm. you find an opportunity that this, this sector is going to boom and then you jumped on it? This is like what really pushed you or? You didn't really think about it this much. 
I thought I thought that there was uh, yeah an opportunity in uh, enterprise mobility in the start. That's that's where I started after working selling Cisco uh, and Nortel and Enterasis, Red Hat training, Microsoft training even uh, in the in the early days. In the two thousands, I got very much involved in enterprise mobility. So funnily enough, um, I think David Thody was my two or three up manager at at Mobile Net. And I was one of the very first people that was responsible for selling uh, mobility, uh, things like BlackBerry, mobile cards. But it was taking the phone beyond just from making a voice call to uh, allowing it to help people, whether it be a, a legal firm that tries to gather some case notes or files from the phone or whether it be a, uh, a delivery driver that um, had a, an instant enter pick up drop off, so there was no double handling of paper, a paper clipboard or an inspector. Mm. So they were very simple use cases, but they were enough to to make people want to. So you go have ahead. really seen yeah. the shift, the transition from from a, a, a dumb mobile that doesn't do much, except mm. like doing the the actual call to more um, a business tool. It's definitely, definitely. Look, as uh, I may have mentioned before, so currently the last few years been in cyber, but yeah, definitely I've, co- I've covered that that network, uh, the mobile phone, the evolvement of, of that, getting into SaaS and now more into cyber. But yeah, de- definitely the the sell, I guess the, the sell for cyber is quite unique at the moment, but the, the sales motion back then for investing in enterprise mobility was was essentially the same. There would be Obviously, your commercial customers, but the enterprise customers usually needed a, a touch point with procurement, with um, with the, the users, with the with the IT manager at the time. Now okay. it's usually the the CIO that you speak to. So there's you know four or five different people that you needed to speak to to get something like that across the line, and typically it would go towards a, an approval board of some mm-hmm. of some level. Yeah. So you've been with the, you started with mobile industry in in, in the actual IT. And then what was next for you? Where did you go afterwards? It's, look, it's funny you say that because when I look at cyber, people, cyber professionals at the moment, and you look at their career history on LinkedIn, many of them have come from maybe a governance, risk and compliance background, but many of them come from a networking background. And they, they naturally do go into areas like cyber, which is high demand at the moment. So I've often thought about how, how that happens as well, how people gravitate. And it could be because when they're um, out of a role or they're looking for a new role, there's so much demand for cyber roles at, at the moment where, uh, as, as I mentioned to you before, usually the vendor will, will um, send you on some sort of enablement to get, to get you started. And uh, because there's more roles available, there's, there's going to be very few roles available for selling uh, phone systems, for example. People naturally move to the, the industries that are, that are high in demand. Okay, so but, this is what you did back then? Definitely. Yeah, I noticed I noticed roles that were available, uh, and they were, for example, I moved from had the chance to move from Telstra after many years to to go to Salesforce, and that was a that was something I always wanted to do. I had the chance to get into Salesforce when they first came to Australia, missed out on missed out on that opportunity, and uh, had a chance a few years later. So um, the move from telco sales to to software sales is is different. And it's a, there's a little there's a little more skill involved because you usually have to not only sell the benefits but s- enable the organisation to find budget that it it didn't have allocated because it didn't know that it needed that um, that software to to provide value to the organisation, be it saving time, saving headcount, um, speeding up processes, whatever it might be. So you progress in the world of IT technology, but you did dive in really deep in in the corporate work. And mm. to some extent, uh, I think you are one of the few people that I actually know mm. that played the game really well, if you want to call it a game. Mm. Tell us a bit about the corporate world, the corporate mm. environment, mm. the secrets, the ins, the outs. Mm. What does it take you just to survive mm. in a corporate mm. environment? It's a good question. A lot, of my, a lot of my friends and peers have their own businesses and it, and it is rewarding. I think it's interesting to know that sometimes it's not a nirvana to have your own business. Uh, sometimes if you've got a young family and you need to dedicate time to them, my family's older now, so they, they don't need me much at all. But when you're, when they were younger and if you do have a business and you're a, um, 
a reasonably small operator where you need to do the quoting, do the execution, do the sales, and then come home and work on your accounts and submit a quarterly bad statement mm-hmm. or whatever it is, it can really take up a lot of your time. So I I did go down the the corporate path. I haven't I haven't really regretted it. I've been relatively lucky. I've had good management. I've noticed the people, uh, again, peers that have gone into their own businesses have either wanted to do it from from an after tax benefit perspective because of um, the way that you get paid in a corporation and the expenses that you can offset to maximise the money in your pocket. But I noticed that some people also go into businesses because they've had a bad experience with a manager and they've they've promised to themselves that they they never want to go through that again and they want to do their own business. So luckily for me, uh, I wouldn't say I'm I'm very political, but I've, I've been relatively lucky and you know, haven't always been able to deliver each and every quarter, but generally speaking, I'd, I'd hit or exceed my KPIs and that's put me in a good relationship with the team and uh, with, with management. So uh, reaching your targets every mm. year, does it make you a safe person in a big corporate environment or is it more your relationship, your connections internally? <laughs> well, what plays a major role between the two? Yeah, look, me me personally, I've got a, a fairly um, calm, collected type character. So I, I've been through quite a few quarters. I mean, 25 years of selling in IT, that's four quarters, that's 100 quarters. And every quarter that you that you get, it's it's the, the most important quarter. And, uh, you know, there used to be a saying, you're only as good as your last quarter in sales. Correct. These days, it's you're only as good as your next quarter. So you yeah. can still close a whole heap of business. And I know some salespeople that actually get depressed when they close a big a big deal, which sounds crazy, but it's because their pipeline now has gone well, from, is. yeah, the pipeline decreases. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, look, just to get back to the question, I think that the, um, the, 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 sales, the sales motion is, is similar across different industries. And I've been relatively lucky selling a mixture of software, uh, network services, managed services, professional services, advisory and consulting. So generally speaking, I've been lucky enough to work for an organization where you can pick and choose what you can sell mm. to, to make your number, depending on what's the, what's, what the market desires at that point in mm. time. So selling mm. is, is an art and mm. I do accept that it is an art and it takes you years and years to learn and, and do it really well. Mm. What was your experience in the world of management? How many hours do you have? <laughs> uh, look, with with management, I've I think you remember, remember me in in Telstra, where I was the um, the national manager of smart. I don't remember leaders. you. I remember you really well. Yes, so I I wasn't in your team or anything like that at the time, but I remember crossing paths with you back in back in Telstra, and I had a team of BDMs nationally that that sold uh, smart community IoT to, to Greenfield's environments. That's just an example uh, that, I, that, that you remember um, us, us talking to. Another one is I've been a general manager before for a Swiss company. And uh, prior to that, uh, a US company, I was a, um, a national sales manager in that digital connectivity space as well. I think the, I think the secret is not burning your, your team with too many leading indicators, finding out what those leading indicators are. Uh, so, for example, uh, how many people can can you bring into the office for a tour or how many um, proof of concepts can you make? And as a team, if you work with them and then they know how many they have to do mm. to hit the goal, then I find that they're a little bit more motivated and they can go home on a Friday and think, you know, I've, I've either won or lost as opposed to just saying, look, we've we've really got to get more business through the door, focus on revenue, focus on profit, focus on collecting, you know, bad debt, mm. whatever it might be. I think that's that's really the the key that's worked for me in management. And it, it So what it goes behind the scenes in the management mm. work? There are a lot of politics yeah. uh, and um, I don't know, like, do you need to protect yourself more than protect your position itself mm. or mm. what I think comes it, first, your team, the yeah. feedback that you get? Tell yeah, us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. It, it depends on the position. So I've been in positions where I've managed sales leaders and I've also been a sales leader and I've also been a sole contributor. So I found that when I was even a manager of sales leaders in that general management position, 
you really were focused on year on year growth and you were focused on return on sales and you were focused on revenue coming in the door. So regardless of, I found that whether you're a sole contributor or a one up or a two up from the sole contributor, generally what keeps you up at night is, is the same hit, hitting your number. Uh, and then obviously there's net promoter score and other, other, um, non, you know, other more qualitative measures. But what goes on behind the scenes? I think forecasting is a big one. Getting the getting the forecast right, and with the pipeline, not having not ruling by fear, where people put in an artificial forecast just to make you feel good mm. and, and your managers, and then it gets to the end of the reporting period, and they say, "Look, sorry, I, I can't bring it in on time." So, so normally, yeah. when you look at this pipeline, do you, do you guess straight away that in this, there's not a lot of reality or truth in it, or you just yeah look for? Yeah, at at the moment, I'm not in a I'm not in a sales leadership position. I'm in a uh, no. From your experience, oh, in the past, yeah, yeah. Right at the moment, I'm not not in a leadership position. But uh, I guess uh, two or three years ago, when, when I was looking at it, it's just really how you how you can help the individual that's in your team. If it's more of a I'm over here, you're over there, you're distant. I'm just asking you questions. Uh, journalistically without really giving much value uh then i think the quality of the pipeline is not as rich whereas if you're helping closing the deals obviously don't overbear on your team and say look oh, take me into this customer i want to see the customer but if they if there is a chance to get involved with procurement with i guess in software even at the level of the um the digital innovation teams the ones that actually write the software and the use cases, even management can get involved in that level. It doesn't always have to be, okay, I'm a sales director or a general manager, put me in touch with the general manager of of your customer mm. and that's going to create business. It doesn't always work like that. So there's no hard and fast rule of what, how a manager can help, but I think there's some emotional intelligence that they that the manager can, can project to be able to give their team um, a level of trust uh, for them to be able to truly share a, a, a genuine pipeline instead of a fabricated pipeline. Mm. Excellent. So this is like the, the business part of management, but there's yes. also the human mm -hmm. side. Mm. How do you deal with your um, your team members? Mm. Do you look at their situation, their, their family situation, social mm. life, or you mm. just keep it separate? I think most most businesses have a, a family first type policy as well, and I, I know when I've been in situations where people have had personal circumstances they've had to attend to. That's that's not a problem. They can take time off, uh, you know, within reason for for as long as they need. And uh, I, I think it's more than that as well. It's not being um, creepy or overbearing and ask them personal information about their family, but having that balance where you do genuinely care about their their family, you remember their children's names, uh, how was sport on the weekend, did you get up to anything and try to let them talk about their their children. And they, they may not, the, your team members may not have children. It might be caring for a sick parent. But, yeah, just trying to take some genuine interest. But finding that balance of not being too um, investigative about what's what's happening at home. It, look, it's, the human part is very important. And, again, based on what I was saying before, there is – more of a risk of people leaving uh, your team and uh, if, if they, they don't feel comfortable with you. But at the same time, I th I've got a strong belief that most people don't want to cause any harm or mm. try to derail your KPIs as a manager as long as you reveal your KPIs and how they can help you get their KPIs yeah. and let them know, let them feed up what they can do to to help with those KPIs as well, as as what I mentioned before. So if you if you have that balance, gen, gen, generally people will want to help you. Of yeah. course, there are some that uh, may not and may not be on the on the pathway of the of the company strategy, but that's that's quite normal. That's a very small percent, maybe less than five percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So out of your team, you would have like I don't know many people mm -hmm. in your team. Would you have preferences as a manager <clears throat> normally? Would you say, oh, look, uh, roll on this part of my circle, my inner circle, or he's not, mm. and then I can give him um, better better accounts, I can look at after him. Would managers do stuff like that <clears throat> normally, even unintentionally? Mm. 
I think I think it's prevalent. It's it, definitely in the SaaS industry. It, typically, what happens is there would be a, a target, call it you know two million dollars US a year, and you you might start off as the company's growing with ten accounts, and your target would stay at two million dollars. Usually, annual contracted value is the measure, not not GP, and you would need to hit that with less and less customers. So that naturally does happen as organizations grow. I think that happened more in the low interest rate environments. And you, and you remembered in the in the 2020s and 2021s, you had AWS and Google and the major software companies hiring a lot of people. Yep. Uh, and then it's, it reversed a bit in the last in the last six months. But that did happen due to the way that the companies operate and you would you would generally lose accounts until you really need to hit that let's call it $2 million target with one or two accounts. And that was pretty hard if you'd already sold into that account wall to wall yep. and you had nowhere to go. That that does still happen. In terms of favorites, it, it can happen. I, I personally try not to. Sometimes you you project, you, you like people that are like yourself and you really need to try hard to to not not to be like that because if you dish it out, there could be some karma, I guess. Um, <laughs> And that's going back to what you were saying before about gentle, gentlemen of the industry and uh, not the industry, but the, I, the IT sector that are people that I've come into con- contact with. So yeah, there, there probably is a bit of that karma as well. You just want to treat people the way that you'd like to be treated. And, you know, if it doesn't come back to you, it may come back to a family member one day, yeah. a child so or whatever. One, going one of the, the questions that always yeah. puzzles me and always think about it is like, why, Joe, I have, didn't make it? to the top level in the corporate environment. Yeah. How come Joe is not a CEO now? Or Because you really have played um, the game really well in the corporate mm. environment. Mm-hmm. What do you think was lacking? It doesn't have yeah. to be as personal for mm. you specifically, but in general. That's a good question. Look, with, with myself, I have gone up to middle management. I haven't really gone to senior executive management, although um, I, I think that, Perhaps my future, there, there could be some opportunities there. It's generally it was a choice for me when I did work for a, a Swiss organization. I was traveling quite a bit. I didn't mind the travel domestically, but I had a young family and uh, I had international travel, yeah. but often it was over the weekend. So it'd be a two week stint and you were away on the weekend. And I thought that that was a little bit too much for me. So I think excessive travel on the weekend and you miss games of sport and the like. Um, that's pretty important because you'd, mm. you'd, reg- you'd regret missing that later on. So um, in terms of being strategic, I think I am strategic. Could I be a CEO? Uh, maybe of a very small company, not a not a large one. But, yeah, in terms why of advisory. Like why? Don't you have to aim high and then just uh, reach whatever you can? Yeah, sure. I think just the time. I'd have time. to – I'd ha- it really the job would have to be my family and I think my family would, would suffer. Uh, yeah. and, and my relationships. We'll get to your family in one second. Sure. Um, so you have seen it. You have seen it all. You've been in this industry for many years. Mm. Um, well, the latest trend in the market, you've got AI and cyber mm-hmm. security. Um, what comes first, cyber or AI? There's many different ways you can put it. If you if you look at ChatGPT at the moment, and as, as I said, I'm doing cyber consulting at the moment, uh, not just even to executives and, and boards. So it's it's a hot topic at the moment. Many boards actually put cyber as a number one agenda item these days. So it's it's a very important topic, but there's many different ways you can answer it. But if you look at the most common one, chat GPT, a lot of organizations allow u- utilization of chat GPT in the workplace. And uh, quite a few people are, are putting sensitive corporate information onto chat GPT. Exactly. And they don't realize that it actually becomes part of the AI. So there are certain blockers that you can get. I know uh, there are some cybersecurity companies that block that utilization, and it's a it's a module that you can just buy on top of some existing uh, cloud security software. So that's that's something that's very simple and easy to implement. But I probably wouldn't I probably wouldn't stop. But in the, general, mm, do you think anyone can stop the use of AI in this specific time? Well, if you look at that example of, of chat GPT as well, on a, on a corporate PC, it'd be blocked down. However, there's probably nothing stopping a person emailing it to their personal sensitive company information to go to their personal email account and on their personal commu- 
computer at home, then putting it into their own chat GPT. So you probably wouldn't be able to, to, to stop that. Funnily enough, I mean, AI is used in a lot of cybersecurity software now to defend against threats yeah. and uh, prevent... To create threats and defend. That's and right. Defend. That's right. It's not just AI, but also computing power. So now with the rise of quantum computing, uh, that puts a lot of computing power into the hands of hackers. And as such, they can de uh, decrypt uh, highly sensitive uh, passwords and um, encryption. So, so the, the, um, the bad actors are, are getting access to quantum computing and yeah. the power, but then the, the corporations also need to arm themselves for that and put extra cryptography on the data uh, as it's at rest and through um, the transmission and implement other other security policies to to maximize oh to minimize the level of risk mm. you, to answer your question you never get to a, to a zero risk there's yeah. always some risk it's what risk is the organization yeah, we're talking more yeah. in cybersecurity down the track but uh, mm. just for you as as Joe if you can you can imagine like you had this AI capabilities 10 years ago between your hands can you imagine where Joe would be now? For me personally, surprisingly, I don't think it would make a great deal of difference. If I was a coder or was was writing some sort of technical code, yes, I would say it would save my time. Or if I was a journalist and I asked the the um, the AI to be able to generate something for me, definitely. But I do think even now the the prevalence of AI in prospecting to try to win new accounts over and, and do reach out on in the greenfield space, I think is it, it, it's good, but gen, usually people that are targeted will know it's an AI message. So if I'm reaching out to someone, I might say something like, um, you know, I'm connected to you by XYZ on LinkedIn and I'm based down at uh, in George Street to make me sound like a a human as opposed to something that sounds very verbose created on AI and it's been fed artificially, but it is, it is getting better. Uh, and the other, the advisory side as well, and the, the strategy execution piece, probably not a great deal, but I can see a lot of industries that or, or individuals that would have uh, had a different career trajectory if they, if they um, stumbled upon AI mm. early. Yeah. So going back to security, cyber security specifically, yeah. um, which is like really the environment that you're working in now, mm -hmm. what is the future? Oh, there's there's many different areas, many different areas. But one one area at the moment is obviously that's growing is endpoint detection and response. So securing endpoints. Uh, there's also cloud security. So a lot of organizations, they move their workloads to the cloud and there are native cloud security uh, features in AWS and Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud Platform, but it's not often not adequate enough for uh, the organization's needs. So there's the whole cloud security piece. That will still continue. And uh, one of the other trends is operational technology security. So you've got the IT domain and typically the operational technology, which is your factories, your warehouses, your, uh, not all businesses have them, but obviously the mining, the, the retail, uh, those, those sort of businesses that are moving to IoT, uh, they are seeing the benefits of being connected to the internet, which then it opens up a whole new attack surface for, for, um, threat actors. So therefore there's a whole other industry that is, dovetailing on the back of that and that's called ot security mm. so there's many many vendors that that work across that that space and it needs management and it needs monitoring so there's mm. that they're one of the trends and then the, probably the last one is uh cyber risk and quantifying your cyber risk so it can be um made into an easy to understand layperson's language that then is presented to the board and the board then decides on how much they want to reduce their risk by and how much they're willing to invest to do that. That's a big one at the moment. So this more in the micro level, at the macro level, yes. you know, like during the war now, cybersecurity is playing a major role in the war between countries. Mm -hmm. um, can we prevent this or this is like the new type, the new style of war between 
countries moving forward. What is your thoughts? De- on that? Definitely, so I see that on a daily basis. So uh, some customers that I see at the moment, in terms of where they're getting attacked from, usually Australia, it's uh, Russia, it's China, it's North Korea, even Iran to some some extent, and uh, they're probably the the largest. Um, initiators of, of um, breach of breach um, capability that we're seeing mm-hmm. in in the country, and uh, I, I do see it. it's it's on the rise. So yes, it does need people monitoring a customer's environment. It needs either the them to be in house in a customer and have regular sessions with directors and leaders in the company to let them know what to do and what. Uh, mitigation they need to put in place to reduce those control gaps, or it can be outsourced to a security provider. And again, it's about that security provider being proactive and then communicating back with their client to let them know what's going on. But it's it's not something that can really be stopped. And it's there's lots of vulnerabilities that's presented to an organisation and and vulnerability data. But it's about what ones they actually act. Mm. Act on. They can't act on all of them. Do you think Australia is playing any role in the cybersecurity um, sector? No, definitely. I mean, Australia, uh, Australian government has received uh, re- re- uh, released a framework called Essential Eight. I'm not sure if you've heard of Essential Eight. So, yep. readily available framework that you can find on on Google. Yep. And it is good, but it's basically a compliance framework. So if someone wants to comply to Essential Eight, another one's called NIST. Um, yeah, if, NIST is more international. Wasn't that's it? correct. NIST. So is more what they did, they did a cut-off version and then do the Essential Eight. Yes, stuff. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Do we love to simplify stuff here, like in Australia normally, and this like the trend or Essential Eight is really for Australia for an Australian environment? Look, businesses need to do something, whether they they outsource it if they. If they have weak cyber controls, then typically by law, if they get a breach, they have to report that to the Office of the Information Commissioner. Uh, And there are quite hefty fines for that, which can be imposed. But getting back to the security frameworks, if you comply to a framework that just says do this and and patch regularly and install a firewall or, or whatever it might be, most of the organisations that have had significant breaches still complied 100% to Essential 8 or NIST. So that's the, that's the interesting thing, that there's uh, what we're finding a different way to look at it and uh, map it to uh, other frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK. And uh, MITRE, MITRE ATT&CK is a, is a US-developed uh, framework. Uh, it's another one to look at, but if, if you can, in real time, connect to your cyber controls and see how they're doing. Uh, it puts organisations in a much better position to understand their risk at a point in time in dollar terms. So they can press a button and say, we've got $10, $10 million of risk. This is how we can fix it. As opposed to uh, a report that a third party comes in and just writes a report on how how are you doing with uh, cyber risk posture today because yep. once that report is written and given to the customer it's generally out of date so there are new technology uh new technologies available that use apis connect to cyber controls and give people specifically the board and the and the head of uh, security cyber to to have those conversations on what to do mm, excellent mm. going back to joe joe the human joe the person <laughs> um Joe, you've been in this industry for many years and obviously um, you kept on learning different technology every now and then. Um, is it the best way to stay alive in this industry or what is your recommendation maybe just to focus in one sector and then expand your knowledge in it? Mm. What is your advice in that? Mm. Yeah, I've, funnily enough, I've found that if – in the past, if I've gone for a job interview or, or whatever it is, and I look at the company's YouTube videos, you'd be surprised on the amount of people that work for that company that have never seen those YouTube videos. So in terms of learning in tech, I'd highly encourage using things like LinkedIn Learning. Uh, there's many, for example, in cyber, there's um, ASA, the Australian Information Security Association. Uh, males and females can join this but this one, but it's called Australian Women in Security Network, AWSN. So there's many organisations that people can can join. And 
at the cost of maybe $100 a year, it gives you um, content. And there's also the LinkedIn learning courses that you, that you can do. But generally, the people that I speak in cyber, the hiring managers are saying it's unfortunate, but most of the tertiary degrees in cyber are, are really ill-equipped to prepare people to go in cyber. They'll still hire people from those degrees because they understand a lot of the acronyms that they're going to come across in cyber. But yeah, it doesn't send the foundation. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's not it's definitely not necessary. I know that many industries hire people that are, that have never never uh, gone ahead with any cyber role before because it's not it's not technical in terms of traditional IT networking where you might have to get up on a whiteboard and draw a cloud diagram and be an architect. You don't really, although there are cyber architects, you don't really need that for cyber. You need to know. Uh, a little bit. You could come from a psychology background. You can come from a governance, risk and compliance background. You can come from a technical background. But typically, I mean, you're talking about AI before and its interaction with cyber. Uh, AI, as you know, at the moment can write software. So there's software that writes its own software for specific customer journeys. Uh, and the the AI um, AI enhanced cyber tools can also help monitoring uh, monitor customer environments as well. So do you yeah. prefer to be like specialized in one industry or just be across everything? Mm. At the moment cyber is keeping my my personal brain full in terms of technical. It it really depends. I personally like business strategy combined with IT strategy. I've always I've always been in that space. Mm -hmm. And now with an organisation. If you if you take a look at some of the the recent infamous breaches that Australia has had, many of these organisations have tried so hard and they've invested millions of dollars to uh, be a a favoured brand with Australians. And unfortunately, a cyber incident not handled correctly uh, did really undo a lot of that work. So I think business strategy and now. Uh, IT and security, cyber security, really needs to go hand in hand. Mm. Yeah, so working in this industry um, really requires, or I mean, the basic of it is just to make money, mm -hmm. and financial stability is a major role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When would you say, okay, um, it is time for me just to start looking for something else, look mm -hmm. for another position? Mm -hmm. Is there any trigger, like, and how do you just, how do you find out if you really you have been really paid well in whatever you're doing now or should, it's time for me to look for something else i think it depends if you have a if you have a young family or you've got a expensive desire to travel uh, or you've got lots of cash out, outflows whether it be family or hobbies or toys generally you do want finances to be a major part of the picture before as as you grow in your in your 20s and 30s but i think as as you get older you become more wise and you still obviously want to be able to maximize your um your income but job satisfaction comes into it more so and the team that you work with it's it's no good uh just earning in in a corporate environment earning a, a overachieving on on your number which is almost it's theoretically impossible to overachieve on your number each and every month to the same extent it's going to going to fluctuate so based on that I, I find that job satisfaction and and the people that you work with become more important later in your career mm -hmm. so they become more important than how much you make in money every year i think so yeah and so there's a bit of giving back as well so i find there's i personally do mentoring uh specifically more with uts which is where i went and I'm on their their uh, mentoring hub, mm -hmm. but I find a lot of peers that I work with also mentor. Uh, ideally, they like to mentor back to people that they know or from their own uni or from their school. Uh, but yeah, generally they I find that people get get over their forties and and they want to be able to give back. Or yeah. yeah. Okay, so you did mention your family so many times in the conversation that we have. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, they do play a major role in your mm -hmm, life. Mm -hmm. um, what is the compromise between your business life and your family life? Mm -hmm. Do you make any compromise or how does it work? Well, typically in tech, you, you need it's not just a nine-to-five role. And I wouldn't say that there's too many very early mornings with me. But after, say, eight o'clock, you're usually on. It's more the evenings. I've usually worked for 
European or US organisations that because of the time zone difference, you, you're usually expected to do those. Yeah. If there was something critical that you had on for the family or, or whatever it is, generally they're understanding. But I, I find that, that that is a bit of an impact and there's a bit of um, controversy about that in the news recently about the, the right right to disconnect. I think there needs to be a good balance between employer and employer and healthy conversations. But the impact, I, I guess, I've, as, as I mentioned to you before, I, um, I like to travel, but I don't usually like to travel away from the family over the weekend. And uh, domestically is fine. Internationally is good as well, but probably once or twice a quarter, no, no more than that really, mm. uh, because you miss you miss a lot of milestones. For example, my son uh, played his last basketball game forever on um, uh, last week on a on a Saturday. Forever? Well, uh, in terms of uh, year twelve. Oh, okay. so he can take basketball up in the future. But the basketball season's just finished, and I was really glad that I made that game. I would have really been upset if I missed that game because it's the end, end of an era, and that's what I was doing on Saturdays for for the last few years. So it just it happens very quick. So yeah. while we're talking about your family, you've got kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you advise them to just go into the world of technology and IT, or what is your advice to them? Yeah, so, so I have three kids, and uh, my children, the oldest two, could have got into tech, but they have chosen not to. One of them's at university, not doing tech, and the other one did do uh, information processes and technology in year 11. I think because I, I forced, not forced him, but I coaxed him to do that, but he didn't like mm-hmm. it. So I said, I'll just get out of it and do something else. The youngest one may do something in, in tech, but it, it's really, I, I tried to tell them it doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're in medical or, or um, you're in property or construction, tech is is intersecting with any industry and you need to know the basics. You, as I said to you before, you need to know the terms. And if you grabbed a book of acronyms with IT, you, it'd go in one ear and out the other. But as you, as you slowly uh, put yourself in touch with many different domains of IT, whether it be um, a modern workplace or whether it be network connectivity or whether it be cyber or whether it be SaaS or CRM systems, generally the acronyms do do um, come into your mind and you, you know what you're talking about and you're able to um, uh, keep up with people. Otherwise, yeah. if there's a business conversation and, and an acronym is said you, and you don't know what it is, it'll, you'll spend, you know, 30 seconds trying to think what that was and then you've lost the rest of the conversation. Yeah. So I think it's just by um, osmosis and people being in the industry mm-hmm. for, for a while, they, they would pick it up. But yeah, in terms of getting my kids into tech, it, it's re- they may end up in tech, but they haven't they haven't studied tech. Mm. Excellent. So you've been in sales many years now, and every mm. quarter is like man another challenge, another a lot of stress you go mm. through, mm. especially in IT. Um, how do you stay fit, both at the physical and mental level, or um, have you ever been through a bad experience, especially mentally? in this environment. Mm. Would you like to share anything like this? Sure. I think think the best way to keep fit is to buy your children a dog because they will never walk it after the first (laughs) week (laughs) and you'll be walking it every day. So that's probably the, that's probably the best way to to do that, which is, which is what I do. And that, that does keep me fit. I usually walk the dog um, every day or most of the time it's nine, 10 o'clock at night, but still I get, I get out there. Uh, How do I keep fit? Bit of mountain biking, uh, you know, not very intense gym, but I've got my kids going to the gym with me now. Just general gym work, walking, bit of running, bit of swimming. Nothing, nothing too major and intense. Mm. Uh, nothing more than there, there's there's some real um, people that I work with that are doing ultra marathons and the like. So it's definitely nothing like that. Yeah, and just try to just try to take care of what you put in your your, your body. Um, the type the type of foods you eat, and mentally just have your prior priorities in life. Really, yeah. um, what is Joe's priorities in life now? Um, my priority in life at the at the moment is just continuing in a in a good career, um, contributing back to to the industry, giving back giving back to uh, school age children or university children. I've actually got a talk uh, later in March on cyber and tech to some year 11 and 12 leavers that 
I'll try to encourage to get into get into tech and really just be there for your family. I mean, when your kids are, um, as mine are now, between the ages of sort of 14 and 19, it's difficult to get any time with them. So I don't, I don't really spend a lot of, a lot of time with them, but I, I'm glad that I did when they, they were younger and when they grow older, I'm sure there's a time that they'll want to come back to dad and hang out with him. But at the moment they're pretty evenly spaced and they're in their, their own world. So that's probably my, my, uh, my goal, just to continue on the path mm. and uh, try to give back a bit to the community and stay in a rewarding career, working with good people and, and uh, clients that you can help. Do yeah. you think you did a good balance between your uh, professional life and your family life? I think so. Yeah, personally, I, I did uh, uh, three, three to four years for a science degree and then I took about five years off from studying. Then I went back and did an MBA, but I finished an, my MBA before I had kids or pretty much on the year that I did. I have spoken recently to, for some people that did an MBA while they have kids and it's it's quite difficult depending on their, their ages. So try to do as much study as you can before if it's a formal degree that's very intense. Otherwise, you could just take one subject a semester and reduce the workload. In terms of putting study away and for work, generally there hasn't been that much interruptions. There's been a bit of travel, but generally even when you travel, you can stay connected with what's going on. So I, I'm fairly lucky and that's why I encourage my children to consider a career in tech because regardless of whether you're working for yourself, which does take a lot of capital and entrepreneur real risk to actually create that business. Or if you want to work for an organization in tech, I think it's a generally rewarding career and it offers flexibility and a good mix of skills that you could get into other industries. There's no reason you can't jump into other industries when you've been out, been in the tech industry and you, you want to tra mm. transition to other industries. You've got a lot of soft skills that you build up like, you know, problem solving, uh, communication, leadership, and just general um, team skills. You've mentioned traveling a lot of times. Yeah. Um, in, in this episode so far, um, you as Joe, would you, for example, sell your house wherever you're living and change the country where you're living and uh, just to chase a position that it, that it is really offered for you, that you see it as an opportunity? Would you go and do the extra mile mm. and, and I, change I your locations? Yeah, I would. Look, I, I think... It's a good question, and again, it comes down to the time of life. I think if your children are in secondary school, early secondary, then I think you could. If they're in that critical stage of maybe years 10 to 12, I would probably not recommend it because of the disruption. But as your children get older, if you do have children, that is, not everyone um, chooses to or can, uh, then that would be a good time as well. So, yeah, I think the answer is yes, but probably not in that in that critical zone, I would definitely, and I, I would definitely like to, you know, sell a house and, and move into a unit and have more, more lifestyle, less, less to look after. It's not something that I would, uh, that I would be against giving you more time to, to look after yourself and, and what you like doing. Excellent. Mm. So back to the tech industry, mm. would Joe um, ask himself, if he did enough for this industry, are you, are you mm. satisfied? Did you have a, an impact in this industry or you were just one member of it and just you're in your high life now and then a few years down the track no one's going to remember you mm. do you think you've done enough for this tech industry do you have a sense I, of ful fulfillment i personally do but I, I, st I still think that there's so many different it related projects that organizations have why I've been successful is that I just understand that what I'm doing at that particular point in time, consulting, advisory, managed services, is a very small piece of it. So you really need to uh, understand that your customers are being bombarded with so much. If, if your customers are in a senior position, as many of them are that I deal with, uh, they're, they're being bombarded by organisations and by AI to respond to their LinkedIn, to respond to their email, and they really run out of time to do their jobs. I speak to some, for example, some chief information security officers that get that get a hundred email in mails a day, yeah. in mails, not emails, through LinkedIn. 
because the CISO is typically known to have more budget than the CIO these mm. days. So I think personally the jobs that I have been involved with to me have been transformational, but to the customer they're just they're just a small piece of piece of the puzzle. So it's really go in there, get the job done and remain in contact for for future opportunities. And I'm sure sure they evolve. Mm. But I, I don't think I don't think they've been hugely uh, impactful to the to the organisations. Mm. Yeah, but I, I I do leave I do have pretty good relationships with the customers that I've had before, and I'm sure I'm connected to a lot of them on LinkedIn, and I'm sure I could call uh, a few that I've built relationships up with many years ago, even though I'm not in those organisations, and take them out for a drink or a coffee or something. So that's important. Excellent. Mm. So you've mentioned LinkedIn many times. Yes. Uh, obviously, social media plays a major role in your life. Mm-hmm. Are you involved in the social media overall? Like, do you have an Instagram account, a Facebook, um, anything other than LinkedIn? Not really. Mm. No, mainly mainly LinkedIn. I used to be a little bit more active on it, and I've I've been an early, very early member of LinkedIn and. Uh, implemented it into one of the teams that I had, Sales Navigator. And as such, I've been invited to a lot of LinkedIn events and talk about their uh, their upcoming releases. I like the I like the idea of LinkedIn being a really accurate customer CRM because if an organization creates their own CRM, it's often out of date when people move around. So if it's got some sort of integration to LinkedIn... I'm sure they're going to offer you a position straight after <laughs> this interview, right? Yeah. So... I think having some sort of integration to LinkedIn, you can build a real-time org chart and you know where your prospects are and where they, where they are at that particular point in time instead of having to manually type them up. What is your advice to the new generation? The new kids now are like graduation, graduating mm. of uni mm. and they're starting their life now. Um, do you advise them to go in the world of IT and technology or is it a stressful environment? What is your advice to them? Oh look, I'm I'm an I'm an advocate for uh, for the IT sector. Definitely, uh, cyber is definitely worth a look at as well. Make sure. So the the other options are if they don't do something in tech, there's two ways they can go in their life. They could go to be a dentist, a doctor, a physiotherapist, pharmacist, where what they do at the start they'll they'll become more. Um, proficient Mm -hmm. in that and they would always typically be in that role Um, look those roles are good but the downside is that you're really let's say if you're an optometrist uh, you'll always be an optometrist and you'll probably just work in the same uh, five square meters for the whole year what is next for Joe? really after all of what you've done so far what is the next step for Joe moving forward well personally i as I mentioned to you before, I'm, I'm always studying every few years. So I did take some time off after um, a software role and, and perform some uh, Harvard online courses in strategy execution and disruptive strategy, which were really good to be able to take that career break and reset yourself for about six months, almost like a mid-career uh, study break. I found that very good. The next step for me is obviously con- to continue in in the advisory and consulting and uh, the, um, the 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 business development type activities that I'm involved with at the moment, and I'll be doing my company director's course soon, and that is for not so much to sit on a board, but just to get an appreciation of how boards work and the implications of tech and cyber on how organisations need to operate effectively. Um, overall, what I've noticed is that Australia is um, it sounds negative, but heavily under attack from other countries compared to our neighbours. And uh, as a result, Australian boards have a, a unique challenge to be able to balance um, unlimited capital investment to to fund a lot of these cyber projects mm. and have enough money left over to be able to operate the business. Uh, it's a it's a real challenge. And um, if you speak, I've spoken to many cyber insurers, and they they glo- that are based globally. And they view Australia as a, as a very high-risk environment to provide cyber insurance mm. too. So I would like to do more study in terms of how boards operate, but generally continue along the same path and work along the, the customer set that I have, which is basically public sector, retail, manufacturing, 
uh, and financial services. I don't see myself getting out out of that space. And yeah, just continue having a enjoyable time in in the workplace, working with good people, and um, continue along with the family. Excellent. Get Excellent. the most out of it. That's fantastic. Great to hear. Joe, let's go back to the first question that I did ask you at the beginning of this episode. Hmm. How did you manage to keep this, um, I don't know, this uh, title of the gentleman of um, the gentleman of the IT industry, especially when hmm. you work in sales for most of your life? Hmm. What was your secret? I think I've always had a, a a saying of let nothing disturb you, let let nothing frighten you. Be don't don't ruffle your feathers for for something that is not going to be important in the next ten to fifteen years. Uh, focus on what you need to do to to um, achieve the goals of you or, or your your team, and uh, it sort of changes the way that you that you deal with people. I find that that then brings everything into focus. You've you've usually got one or two people in the team that you may not get al- along with and that's just part of it. It's I've been fortunate that a lot of people that I have worked with became friends, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. People that you work with are are not usually your friends. They're there for something, you're there for something. And uh yeah, be respectful and and uh don't waste your energy trying to be political in an organization because it's generally very temporary and it creates angst against your peers and can generally come back to bite you in the, in the long term. So I really, I, I think to answer it, a hundred percent has been focused on either developing opportunities for my team, sales opportunities, or for myself, if I was in a sole contributor role, and I can put that a hundred percent on it because I really don't, I don't spend the time uh, on the political which can take 40, 50% of your, of your mind space yeah. if you let it. That would be the secret. Fantastic. Joe, thank you so much for being here today. It was my pleasure, and I wish you all the best in your future. Thanks for having me. It's been good coming in. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Definitely. I think it fills uh, a gap in the market where you often don't find out the intricacies of a person's career journey especially in tech. So uh, this with the, the you know, appropriate questions and really focusing on the journey uh, hopefully helps people make the right career move. Uh, it's very important to have, um, a, you know, a, a career that's, that's satisfying and, uh, you know, your, your career is your, your a major asset probably after, after your house. Um, your, your house is worth millions of dollars or, or thereabouts, but your career, to get 100 grand a year, you need a, an asset of five or six million dollars to, to generate that. And a lot of people don't see that the income that you get from um, your career is, is a major asset in your life. So it's good to fine tune it. You really don't want to be stuck doing something that's soul destroying, uh, which can be very easy to fall into if you work in a, in a large corporation. So it's good to get the the advice from people that have tried things before. And I think Brainsplat is a good platform and probably the only one I've seen like that that gets into the details and uh, has a bit of fun along the way. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joe. Pleasure. Previously on Brainsplat Podcast. That's, that's something I don't have an answer to. But if you've got more women in tech, then it becomes a bigger problem that people take more notice of. But I was earning more money than most graduates. after. But is it all about money? Gun in itself can be dangerous or it can be protective, but if the person holding the gun has ill intent, your perception was how can this person really be a leader in technology when they're not technical and they- Tell me something, would, do you think AI would just make people smarter? Then you're gonna end up with some really dangerous and scary outcomes. And so it's very, again- Yeah, but you what know, do you do? Do you, li- do you box yourself and live in fear that- and stuff while I was studying, and then there were all these guys going upstairs. Everyone will be in because but, you, know, you would know the answer for the future. Yeah, but you know, I was grumpy with the kids and he was just like- We want Emma money. back. We yeah, want, we want Emma, Emma back. back. That would probably be my advice. Keep an awareness of that. Don't push yourself because it's ultimately not worth it in the end. But being on a podcast is, is fantastic. So I think you're doing better than a lot of people. <laughs> Trust me. 
simple matter, spy would be a great way to America did truly believe the rest of the world. Obviously, South Korea was a challenge for them. It was funded by a Dutch company that needed someone that could speak. So you crossed the bridge. I crossed the bridge. You never looked back. Outside of Chicago, did not have a passport. So from diplomacy, espionage <laughs> to technology and IT. And invented with the philosophy, in the case of Microsoft, Around But how do I trust the output? Do I just take it? I mean, it's it's going to have that black box element you don't understand. We're talking about executive sponsorship or playing the right politics with Some it. Some of the concerning uses of AI around upcoming elections. I think, are we doing enough to have our voice? Right? And I'm passionate about voting as an American abroad because. What do you see next for this industry? <laughs> Oh, 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 o